Star Wars, Light of the Jedi, by Charles Sewell. Chapter 8 Agir City, Hetzel Prime. 65 minutes to impact. The Force sang to Jedi Master Avar Chris, a choir that was the entirety of the Hetzel system, life and death in constant contrapuntal motion. It was a song she knew well. She'd heard it all the time, everywhere she went. Here, the melody of the Force was off, a discordant jangle of death and fear and confusion. People were dying or felt the dread of their imminent demise. Threaded through that song, the Jedi and the brave personnel of the Republic and the heroic citizens of Hetzel itself, using the resources they had to try to save the people of these worlds. The Third Horizon had landed not far from the ministerial residence in Agui City, the capital of Hetzel Prime. The Republic was coordinating its efforts with the Hetzelian government to try to stem the tide of the disaster, ensuring the evacuation proceeded in as orderly a fashion as possible, tracking the incoming projectiles, helping as they could. Avar Chris was still on the ship's bridge, still serving as the point of connection for the Jedi in the system, letting them sense one another's presence and location and emotional states. Sometimes words or images came through unbidden, but only rarely. It was all just a song, and Avar sang and was sung to. Still, she was able to gather a great deal of information from what it told her. She knew that 53 Jedi Vectors were currently active in the Hetzel system. She knew which Jedi were working on the planet. For example, at the moment, Bel Zetifar, Loden Great Storm's promising Padawan, was approaching the surface of Etzel Prime at extraordinary speed. Elzar Mann, her oldest, closest friend in the Order, was in a vector of his own, flying a single-person version of the ship near one of the system's three suns. He was almost always alone. Avar was one of only two Jedi he worked with regularly. It was just her and Stellan Gios. This was mostly because Elzar was... unreliable, wasn't exactly the right word. He was a tinkerer, if that term could apply to Jedi techniques. He never liked to use the Force the same way twice. Elzar's instinct were good, and he didn't try anything too unusual when the stakes were high. Usually, his experiments in Force techniques did expand the Order's understanding, and occasionally he accomplished incredible things. But sometimes he failed, and sometimes he failed spectacularly. Again, never when lives were on the line, but even that bit of uncertainty, coupled with Elzar Man's general unwillingness to take the time to explain what he was trying to do, well, some in the order found him frustrating to deal with. Avar believed that might explain his continued status as a Jedi Knight rather than a Master. She knew that bothered Elzar. He thought it was unfair. He didn't care about other Jedi's paths through the Force. Why should they concern themselves with his? He just wanted to follow his road where it led. Avar didn't understand Elzar's explorations any more than most of the Jedi, but the key to their relationship was that she never asked him to explain. Anything. Ever. That arrangement had powered their friendship since their days as younglings together in the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. That, and she just liked him. He was funny, and clever, and they had come up together through the Order, Stellan and Elzar and her, the three of them inseparable through all their years of training. She pulled her mind away from Elzar Man, listening to the Force. She sensed Jedi on the system's worlds, Jedi in vectors, and more on stations or satellites or ships, all around the system, helping wherever they could, usually in conjunction with the 28 Republic long beams deployed by the Third Horizon. The chain of connection through the Force even told her that others of her order were on the way, doing their best to respond to Minister Ecker's original distress call, despite being so far from Hetzel. Closest was Master Jora Mali, future commander of the Jedi Quarter on the just-completed Starlight Beacon, along with her second-in-command, the imposing Trandoshan Master Skier. Stellan Gios was powering in from his temple outpost on Hinestia, as if summoned by her thoughts of him a few moments before, whipping through hyperspace in a borrowed starship, and more besides. Avar sent out a note of welcome and called to every other Jedi she could reach, near Hetzel or not. Distance was nothing to the Force.
Who knew how they might help? So far, the death toll from the disaster was low, barely above the baseline churn of life and death constantly at work in any large group of beings. She was worried that could change at any moment. They didn't have a good understanding of what was happening here. Nothing about it felt natural. She had never heard of anything like this. A huge spread of projectiles appearing in a system, popping out of hyperspace with no notice. She could not imagine what would have happened here if the Third Horizon was not in transit nearby after a refuelling stop, or if their inspection tour of the Starlight Beacon wasn't interminably delayed by the project's overseer, the officious Bith named Shia Tenem. She had insisted on showing her Jedi and Republic visitors every last obscure element of Starlight Beacon's construction, pushing back their scheduled departure and irritating Admiral Cronara immensely. But if they had left on time, the Third Horizon would have been deep into hyperspace when Minister Ecker's evacuation order went out, too far to get to Hetzel in any reasonable amount of time. If not for an overzealous Bith administrator, Hetzel would be dealing with this apocalypse on its own. The Song of the Force. Between what it told Aval directly and the chatter she heard around her from the Third Horizon's deck officers, she was able to maintain an up-to-date picture of the disaster, and all its moments, large and small. Above Hetzel Prime, a Republic technician completed repairs to an evacuation ship that had lost power on its way off-planet, so it could continue on its way to safety. Near the second-largest gas giant, two vectors fired their weapons, and a fragment was incinerated. A long beam pushed past its limits as it raced to reach a damaged station at the system's outer edge. Its engines failed, catastrophically. Avar gasped a little at the cold, dark sensation. And above the fruited moon, one very clear impression, as close to a message as could be sent through the force under these circumstances, a sense from a Jedi knight named Tiami that their understanding of what was happening here was utterly, tragically incomplete. No, Avar said, disturbed at the urgency of what Tiami was trying to pass along. Her emotions roiled, and the song of the force shimmered in her mind, becoming quieter, less distinct. Focus, she told herself. You are needed. Avar Chris calmed her emotions and listened. Now, thanks to Tiami, she knew what to look for. She called the other Jedi's face to her mind. Green skin, high-domed skull, large red eyes, and it took her almost no time to find what Tiami had tried to show her. In fact, now that she was looking, it was obvious. Avar spread her awareness through the system, pushing herself to the limit. I can't miss one, she thought. Not a single one. She opened her eyes and unfolded her legs, setting her feet once again upon the third horizon's deck. Bridge officers looked at her, surprised. She had not spoken or moved in some time. Admiral Cronara was speaking to Chancellor Lena So, who had called in via a high-priority relay from Coruscant. Her delicate, sweeping features were displayed on one of the bridge's comm walls. She looked fragile, which she absolutely was not. Cronara, in contrast, had a face that looked like a hammer would break against it. He looked hard, which he absolutely was. He wore the uniform of the Republic Defence Coalition, light grey with blue accents, the cap tucked under his arm in respect for the Chancellor's office. The resolution on the display was low, with sharp lines of static crossing Lena So's face every few seconds, but that was to be expected. Coruscant was very far away. Thank the light, your ship was close enough to Hetzel to respond, Admiral, Chancellor So was saying. We sent out aid ships as soon as we could, but even receiving the distress signal from Hetzel took time. You know how choppy the comm relays are from the outer rim. I do, Chancellor, Cronara responded. We appreciate anything you can do. We are making progress here, but there will definitely be a large number of wounded, and I am sure a variety of essential systems will need repair. I'll relay word to Minister Echo that you're sending assistance. I'm sure he will appreciate it. Of course, Admiral. We are all the Republic. Avar walked across the deck, passing Cronara as he ended the transmission to Coruscant. He glanced over at her, curious, as she stopped before the display screen, showing the status of the disaster mitigation effort. All the ships, people, Jedi, Republic, locals. Red, green, blue worlds. Lives, hope, despair. She tapped certain of the red anomalies on the screen with her fingertip. 
As she did, they were highlighted, each surrounded with a white circle. When she was done, about ten of the projectiles were indicated. Avar moved back from the display, then turned to look at the bridge crew. They were confused, but polite, waiting for her to explain what she had done. I hate to say this, my friends, she said, but this just got a lot harder. We have a new objective. Admiral Cronara's weathered features twisted into a scowl. Avar did not take it personally. Does it replace the existing mission parameters? he said. That would be nice, she said, but no. We still have to do everything we came here to do. Keep the fragments from destroying Hetzel. But now there's something else. She gestured at the display, with its highlighted red dots racing sunward. The anomalies I have indicated here contain living beings. This is no longer just about saving the worlds of this system. Realisation dawned on Cronara's face. His scowl deepened. So it's a rescue mission on top of everything else. That's right, Admiral, Avar said. A chorus of dismayed voices rose up as the officers realised that all their progress thus far was just the preamble to a much greater effort. How is that possible? How many people? Who are they? Are they ships? Is this an invasion? Admiral Cronara held up a hand and the voices stopped. Master Chris, if you say some of these things have people aboard, then they do. But how do you propose we mount a rescue? These objects are moving at incredible velocities. Our targeting systems can barely hit them as it is. And now we have to dock with them? Avar nodded. I don't know how we'll do this. Not yet. I'm hoping one of you might have an idea. But I will say that every one of those lives is as important as any life on this world or any other. We must begin by believing it is possible to save everyone. If the will of the force is otherwise, so be it. But I will not accept the idea of abandoning them without trying. She moved her hand in a broad circle, encompassing the entire display board. This is all you have to work with, what we brought with us. Every Hetzillian ship is occupied with the evacuation effort, so all we've got are the vectors and the Jedi flying them, plus the long beams and their crews. Find a way. I know you can. I'll send word to the Jedi. The Force might have an answer for us. The bridge officers looked at one another, then scrambled into motion with a surge of activity as they began to plan ten utterly impossible rescue missions. Avar Chris closed her eyes. She stepped up into the air. The Force sang to her, telling her of peril and bravery and sacrifice, of Jedi fulfilling their vows, acting as guardians of peace and justice in the galaxy. The Song of the Force.